Hello everyone and welcome to Hexenkunde. Today we're going to discuss something that I'm sure a lot of people will find in very interesting, and that is the topic of Norse sorcery and magic, and the question of whether there was a type of shamanism practiced among the Norse. The tales of Norse mythology are of course full of interesting characters and they paint very vivid landscapes. Many readers are often fascinated by figures such as Odin, Thor, or Loki, and Norse mythology still holds many secrets today and many researchers have worked hard to uncover these secrets. There is still much to be learned about the cosmology of the ancient Norsemen. The stories of Norse mythology are, of course, full of powerful gods and goddesses and tales of great battles between good and evil, but there's a whole lot more to the cosmology of the Norsemen. Many of these stories have inspired many works of literature and art, and today's podcast is, of course, about Norse Seda. What is Seda? Seda is a type of Norse sorcery and magic. It is an ancient magical practice that has been shrouded in mystery for centuries. We mainly learn about Seda from the Icelandic sagas and family Icelandic sagas. And Seda research dates back to a Norwegian priest called Johan Pritzner, who compared the Seda rituals to the Sami rituals as early as 1877. And other scholars kind of have built their own work and research on top of that. Some of these scholars would have been, for example, the Swedish scholar uh, Oke Olmark and others. And they would have sought to understand the nature of Sailor by studying it from various perspectives, including examining its links to traditional shamanistic cultures across northern Eurasia and beyond. However, shamanism is, of course, a conspicuous. It was established in the 18th century by scholars. It is not a term that traditionally Northern Eurasian shamanistic cultures themselves use, although the word shaman derives from the Tongas culture and language. And there it, what shamanism is depends entirely on the theoretical framework that you're working with. There's by no means a single unified de definition of shamanistic practice today. Oke Olmok, for example, published a research paper in 1939 entitled Arctic Shamanism and Old Norse Seder. And he explores the relationship between these two concepts, was Seder shamanistic or not? And through this lens, we do gain a deeper understanding of Seder and its role in Norse culture. However, uh, Oku Umak, who worked within the framework of Indo-European steppe herders, assuming that Seder would also derive from a proto-Indo-European, Indo-European religion, has nothing to do with shamanism from Siberia, he concluded. That is because he claims that the inner European ancestors of the Norsemen did not possess similar rites and beliefs practiced in native Eurasia. Another expert in this field is the British scholar, Professor Neil Price, who is especially renowned for his highly influential books, such as The Viking Way and also The Archaeology of Shamanism that he edited. Indeed, as Neil Price writes in a research paper published in 2007, this type of Norse sorcery and magic may have had a similar function within Norse society as traditional shamanism does for Eurasian cultures, such as the indigenous Siberian Evenki, Ket, or the Nanai people. And these practices could be used to heal the sick and to bring fortune to warriors going into battle, but were also thought to hold a significance that Seder was a tool to make the human world connect with the world of the supernatural and the spirit world. And like many other ancient cultures, Norse society was of course also invested in magic and sorcery and particularly to in what we know today as Seder. And yes, say they're involved communicating with spirits and harnessing natural forces for healing or for fortune telling purposes and so on. Indeed, the Seder practitioner, the Völva, as we learned from multiple Icelandic sagas, would, for instance, sit on a raised platform, a high chair or a seat, and would then enter an alternative state of mind, alternative state of consciousness to attract, to bind and to manipulate future harvest, for example, outcomes of future battles healing the sick, and so forth. There were many different layers to say their practice. But what about a traditional shamanistic out-of-body travel, for instance, that is so prevalent in the shamanistic cultures and the healing systems of indigenous Siberia? Swedish scholar Oke Hultkrams, who wrote the book Studies in Lab Shamanism in the 1970s together with Louise Beckman, 
concluded that this particular out-of-body travel, which appears to be so ingrained in shamanistic practice in Siberia, appears to be not very present in traditional seder practice at all. On the other hand, Neil Price concluded that in order to really understand Sailor and its role and its place in the Norse worldview, we really have to kind of zoom out of Europe and look at how healing systems and ritual belief systems evolved over time, over a long period of time across the whole Northern Hemisphere. The circumpolar world is often a geographical and a cultural sphere, and it has a strong hunter-gatherer origin and many rites, many beliefs, such as the cosmic hunt myths or the bear ceremony, are deeply rooted in the subsistence and the mode of hunting and gathering. But not for the Norse. However, shamanism, traditional shamanism, is often said and believed to have emerged and to have evolved out of the mentality of traditional hunter gatherer cultures. So, can Sevr be likened to shamanism, practiced in other parts of the world, such as in central northern Eurasia? That was, for example, a question that Graham Harvey asked in 2003. And it is an old Norse term, first and foremost, for a very specific form of ritualistic practices, performed mainly by skilled female seeresses. However, this is not always the case. As we learned, Odin himself was capable of practicing Sevr, and he learned it from Freya. And... There's this term called ergi, which means deviant or unmanly, and it was frowned upon because there are sexual connotations to the practice of seder. And while many practitioners of seder were often female, this was not always the case. And the seer's special language and the methods they were using to contact the supernatural powers would either bind the spirits or the spirit's helpers to the practitioner's consciousness and mind and to manipulate them, to do their will and to do their bidding. These seeresses were often known as the Vödr, which means female bearer of a magic distaff. And here we also find the symbolism of the distaff used for the spinning of wool and textile while sitting on a raised platform, which seems to be so prevalent in sailor practices. And several scholars have noted that linguistically speaking, the word seder itself belongs to a, an Indo-European grouping of words with connotations of binding, especially in a magical context. And it appears to be, however, that there are shamanistic qualities to the practice of seder. But if we have a closer look at what traditional shamanism is, and for instance, in all the Eurasia among indigenous Siberian, Siberians, there are strong differences as well, and we need to look at them to answer the question, is Sailor shamanism? For instance, Sailor was often used for purposes such as divination and healing, while shamanism in other parts of the world, particularly Siberia here, was typically also used for more practical purposes, such as hunting, attracting game, for instance, healing, and also for warfare. And a major difference, Neil Price writes in 2004, is that the Norse had organized warfare and nomadic hunting gatherer cultures of Siberia, for instance, did not to the extent that the Norsemen had. So many people studying Norse mythology and worldview believe that there are shamanistic elements in it and that Norse mythology, mythology itself is shamanistic. That idea isn't new at all. The German scholar Franz Schröder, for example, wrote an article in 1958 called Krimnismol. And he argued in the article, essentially, that the myth of Odin himself hanging on Yggdrasil, on the world tree, is a classic shamanistic motive. And other scholars have picked up on that. For instance, also the British scholar Hilda Ellis Davidson. She also concluded that the motive of the world tree in Norse mythology is, is classic shamanistic and can be found throughout northern hemis the Northern Hemisphere. And this is largely due to the fact that, yes, say there seemingly shares many similarities to traditional hunting and ritual practices from circumpolar northern cultures. Many scholars have combined studies of archaeology and ethnography to further explore these connections and to understand how the Nordic people really viewed their world and their place within it, Sundqvist writes in 2022, 2020. The idea that Norse mythology and consequently 
nor sorcery is shamanistic. Yes, seemingly at first sight, it is. For instance, aside from the world tree motif, shape-shifting is frequently found in the Icelandic and Norse sagas. The ability to shape-shift are also capabilities that Odin possesses. And so we see that there are many different layers to the ritualistic practice in the, among the Norse. For instance, in the Lokasena and in the Völvespo, they also may provide deeper insights into the Norse understanding of the soul for both the human and non-human beings, as Dag Strömberg writes in Seid, text Studia in Nordis Religions Historia, which is also a classic work on Seder research. It appears to be that in Seder, there was a belief that the human soul could travel outside of the body, but could also communicate and actively manipulate and bind and attract supernatural forces and powers. So if we look at what shamanism is and how it evolved and where it comes from, there are many theoretical considerations that we need to look at. And the very concept of what shamanism is, where it came from and how it developed is by far not done and finished. Stephanie von Schnurbein wrote a research paper, Shamanism in the Old Norse Tradition in 2003, is a, a terrific research paper. And we need to see that there are some core features, but there are also differences that make the Seder quite unique. One of these aspects is that shamanism is, of course, not exactly tied to any culture or region. It is a ritualistic tradition, a practice that can be found in a variety of cultures across the world and each with their own unique take on the practice. So if we ask if Seder is shamanistic, we must first understand what shamanism is and how it developed. Only then can we begin to actually answer the question. And an often held assumption is that shamanism was already established and existent in the Paleolithic Stone Age, reflective in rock art and in cave paintings. However, as scholars from Russia, Hungary, and the United States have shown, the origins of shamanism may be much more complex and nuanced. For instance, the Russian scholar Vasilevich wrote in the 1960s several papers that deal with the Tungus culture in Siberia. And she noted that the Evenki, what, what we would call Evenki today, have a very strong set of pre-shamanistic rites and beliefs, the cult of the hearth, the guardian of the animals, and the bear ceremony itself. Bear ceremonialism itself is classified as pre-shamanistic today. For example, by the American scholar Jacobson, she wrote, wrote the book, the, the Dear Goddess of Siberia, also a terrific book from 1992. She also came to the conclusion that the bear cult that the native Siberians have is pre-shamanistic. It was already practiced before shamanism even emerged culturally and historically speaking. And therefore, shamanism evolved with changes in culture, subsistence, and the way a culture and the people related to themselves and the natural environment. And there may be even older layers of rituals and cosmologies already existent before the emergence of what we call traditional shamanism. For example, a set of myths that can be found across the whole northern hemisphere that is possibly one of the oldest myths of northern hunter-gatherers but does not exclusively deal with shamanism at all is the cosmic hunt myths which could be classified in this instance as pre-shamanistic and already told and already having a set of rites linked to it before what we would call traditional shamanism today so if we want to answer, is Shader, is Seder shamanistic? Were pre-shamanistic rites and beliefs also existent in Europe at some point? And how did they evolve into the healing systems and the belief systems that we talk about today, for instance, among the Norse? The question that must be answered here is, how similar were the healing systems in Northern Europe to other Eurasian cultures? And perhaps Seder evolved as a means of cultural contact with traditional shamanistic cultures, for instance, from far northern Scandinavia or possibly even from western Siberia. Another possibility could be that the Seder dates back to an even older set of ritualistic practice that was once widely spread across Europe and beyond the Ural Mountains. Perhaps an animistic perception of the environment had its fair share here, 
maybe it was also shared by European pre-Christian cultures, just the way it is prevalent among indigenous Siberian cultures, based on a mentality that emphasizes relational interactions between humans and nature and non-human beings. Therefore, a European type of shamanism could have also evolved over time due to similar environmental and cultural factors. But can we call it shamanism at this point, or must we look for something else? There's promising research from the field of new animism. Leading scholars such as Graham Harvey are working on that. And we're dealing with a, a new look at what animism is, animism, and how it had its role in the cultural and cognitive evolution of healing systems among hunter-gatherers and among pre-Christian cultures. And for example, to cite an important paper here, and in my opinion, an important idea, although it is not directly related to the world of the Norsemen, the archaeologist Marek Zvilibil wrote a paper, and this paper is from the year 1997. And he dedicated most of his academic career to the Mesolithic period in Europe, pre-agricultural hunting gathering Europe, especially Scandinavia. And he wrote that in his view, the ideological world, the myths and the cosmologies of European hunter gatherers was very similar to that of northern hunter gatherers in Siberia. In his words, this was partly so because they operated in similar economic and ecological conditions. They, had, they shared a similar habitat and a similar mode of subsistence and would be therefore this would be also reflected in the overarching cosmological structure, the belief systems, the myths, the rituals, and the way the healing systems would evolve over a long period of time. But how far back in time must we go to answer the question of why a Northern European type of sorcery com contains seemingly shamanistic elements and is seemingly also similarly structured to other cosmological concepts found among Northern indigenous cultures? Perhaps the question here is not so much about how shamanism evolved in Siberia, after all. It could be that we would have to investigate the deeper and the older layers of cosmologies shared west of Euros in Europe. What kind of cosmology was there before the Vikings existed? What kind of cosmology was in place in Scandinavia before there were any Germanic cultures, in a linguistic sense speaking? What do we know about the cosmological concepts of Scandinavian hunters and farmers, for instance, from the Megalmosian culture? How did these cosmological concepts change during the Neolithic when agropastoralism was adopted? And how did the Neolithic then affect the societies of the Metal Ages in terms of structure and organization? And how would this have its effect on rights, myths, and ideology? Those are questions we would need to answer to fully understand how mystic ontologies and how healing systems evolved in Europe, perhaps parallel to Siberia, and therefore we have similar ideas in place. Perhaps the question is not so much about do we have to look for shamanism in Europe? And maybe even the term shamanism might not be useful at all in order to reconstruct these deeper layers of pre-Christian mentalities and ideologies. We instead might have to carefully differentiate, differentiate between dream, dream cults, ecstatic cults, and finally shamanism as a distinct type of visionary and ritualistic practice. As written in the roundtable discussion of a book called Witchcraft, Mythologies and Persecutions, published in 2008, highly recommend book. The term shamanism should not be applied so easily to European witchcraft or sorcery, even in pre-Christian times, especially because the term shamanism tends to overgeneralize ritualistic processions and the belief systems associated with it. On the other hand, the question of searching for shamanism outside of its Eurasian sociocultural context has been widely debated and with very mixed results. However, there are scholars who have argued that a type of Eurasian shamanism may have been inherited from older cultures among the so-called Indo-European steppe herders as well. How shamanism in Europe, therefore, evolved and how similar it was to Asia in both cognition and cultural evolution 
it's still very much a need for further research. There is, there is no guaranteed answer here at all, including if the term shamanism should even apply to the pre-Christian healing systems and how they evolved over time, or if there's a need for an entirely new theoretical framework, as scholar Cliff Tolley writes in 2009. How such cults may have evolved over time since pre-Christian times is a complex field of research, and consequently, we must treat this with great care and in a nuanced fashion. Otherwise, we will just end up with speculation and false information and we gain nothing from it, especially not if we simply make up whatever we want to believe in today. We should totally refrain from that if we want to truly understand what these healing systems and rituals were all about. Indeed, there is promising research in regards to the concept of animistic ontologies and whether pre-Christian cultures in Europe, such as the Norse, shared cosmological features of Northern Eurasian cultures. So animism in this instance would be understood as a relational ontology and a relational interaction with the environment and the environment and the eco eco ecology of a, of a culture would directly influence myths and rituals. And yes, this, they could have, these ideas could have evolved in pre-Christian Europe in similar ways as it has in Eurasia due to quite similar ecological and economic conditions since pre-agricultural times. But is shamanism even the right language to deal with the question if Sailor is shamanistic and whether or not there was a European shamanism? I hope you, under, I hope you enjoyed this first podcast of mine. We will have many, many more episodes on this topic on Norse sorcery and magic, on European ethnography, prehistory. We will be looking at traditionally indigenous northern hunting cultures, traditionally shamanistic cultures with ethnographic and ethno-historical material from academic books, academic research papers. I'll be digging through the academic journals as much as I can and to present you with really well-researched information. And I hope you enjoy my work here at Hexenkunde. Thank you for watching.